All right. Um, so welcome to the room. Welcome the millions um, at the um, in, in the Teams call. Um, so I think we're ready to start. Um, uh, I mean, thanks for, for having me here. Uh, I will I'll talk a couple of seconds um, about me as well and what I'm doing and why I'm supposed to talk about outcome versus output and some kind of software engineering tech KPIs. Um, maybe starting with things. Uh, is there any question already? No. Um, so, so maybe thanks uh, Björn for inviting me. Uh, congratulations to the new office. I mean, you picked like the worst time in the year. Um, snow, right? For the ones uh, not being here, it's super snowy. I was a bit afraid whether I get here or not, um, but actually uh, made it. Uh, and, and so, uh, looking very much forward to that session. So, if there's any, if there are any questions, um, feel free to just drop them in the chat um, or in the group here. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, I think we have enough time to to just um, uh, start. Um, all right, then let's get started. Um, so maybe quickly about me. I'm Stefan. Um, I'm CTO and Project A. Uh, sorry, I'm CTO and MD at Project A. Um, we are an operational VC. Um, you can see a bit of information about us here. Um, so investing into startups like the typical ones that you know, um, so from very early stage um, until later stage. <clears throat> Um, some of the um, investments that we, you may know are Trade Republic, as an example, um, something like uh, from the e-commerce space, Spryker, um, probably well known, sorry for the Magento. Uh, I know it's a Magento kind of group, right? But uh, I was aware of that. Oh, sorry. Okay, that, that, that actually may need to leave. Or, no, okay. Uh, um, no, but, but these are a couple of them, and we also do private equity co investments. Um, so uh, typically um, in the in the e-commerce space, uh, so companies like Lampen Belt, for example, um, we also have one, one colleague here um, are part of our portfolio. Um, what differentiates us is um, that we are kind of that we have like true value at investor, right? Uh, so that means uh, we're not just giving money, but we also have that 100 uh, people in our own payroll um, that work very closely with our portfolio together um, and actually try to create as much value as possible. Um, in, in that direction. So maybe before we start, um, one question, uh, and feel free to also get a bit of um, uh, thumbs up or down from the from the audience in the, in the Teams call. Um, so I asked Björn, what will be the audience? And he said, oh, it will be a mix of tech and business people. So maybe asking the question first, who's on the tech side in that room? Okay, that's a very good distribution. Um, so sorry for the uh, for the audience that, that I can't check that here. And who's on the business side? I hope just one person. Okay, what is the rest doing then? Marketing, I guess, or? Uh, Marketing, HR, administration. Okay, all right, so mix. Um, anyways, um, uh, very good that, that there is some kind of uh, tech people here. Um, because I think the interesting question, um, uh, that that's the second question I would like to ask maybe then to the tech people. So uh, who we have actually have heard or said, being on the business side, hey, and take everything takes so long. Okay, you're also all working in great companies. <laughs> Never heard that saying, because that is something uh, I at least get very often asked by, by any founders. Stefan, um, I have no clue, right? Tech is a black box, what's going on there? Um, why does everything take so long? Um, good to hear that on your side, everything is better. Um, that's probably just our portfolio. So let's dig into the topic of I'm framed it like possible KPIs of tech teams, right? Um, because the idea here is to say, um, what is a KPI? Obviously, like a key performance indicator, a number giving you direction whether you're going in the right um, direction or not, and whatever you do um, is the right thing or not. Um, and one question that I, I don't know why business people have that, that question or that need, but one question that I often get asked, so hey, shouldn't we just measure lines of code changed? Um, and every tech person says, yes, that's a great idea. Um, and uh, the business people say as well, oh, what a great idea, should we do that? Um, actually, it's obviously a bad idea. Why is that the case? Super simple, right? Um, I mean, lines of code. Uh, if you're a developer, then you know how to create like a huge amount of comments. I mean, ChatGPT helps us with that as well, <laughs> right? So I can really within, let's say, three minutes, create 10,000 lines of code if I want, um, uh, just in an automated way. Um, that's a commit. Uh, I pushed it to, to my version control system and I'm done. Right, so I'm the best performing developer in the in the world, or at least in my team. Ten x, uh, exactly. That's <laughs> the point, right? So obviously that's not true, right? Because the point here is um, easy to tweak, um, doesn't give any direction whether you're doing meaningful work or not. Um, so, dear business people, please don't ask for that. Um, but it's coming up often. 
The second question that I often get is, okay, should we then go for, for commits, right? Uh, and uh, for you as a business person, do you know what a commit is? Um, it's actually um, putting in that. Uh, as you may realize, I raised the hand for one. Oh, yeah, that's so my mistake. Don't worry. Okay. But I know what a commit is. Okay, very good. Um, so if there's anyone in the call who doesn't know it, what it is, right? It's actually you change code. Um, you push all the changes to something that we call a version control system. And at the end, um, that is a database in containing all historic changes. Now we could rather say, all right, um, if someone changes something in the code, that's probably some meaningful work. So let's just count these commits. Um, uh, taking it up front, that's also a bad idea. Not a surprise here as well, right? Because as I, as a, as a very clever developer, could just say, oh, uh, that's interesting. I'm writing meaningful code. But on the other hand, I'm just taking every character is going to be a new commit. And then again, I'm like a 10x person, right? Uh, the, the best committing person in the team without actually creating any value. Um, and uh, I think, um, I mean, you hire, so typically say developers or tech people are smart people. I mean, that's why you hire them. That's why you pay them the salary they, they get. Um, and uh, um, I think if you if you put KPIs like that in place, um, I mean, they'll just trick it, write a cheat, and actually it's a gamification and you win nothing um, at the end. So let's go one step further. Let's speak about tickets done, right? I mean, we all work with kind of tasks, uh, whether it's Jira or any other ticket management system. Wouldn't it be a good idea to say, oh, let's just count the amount of tickets um, and uh, that's an interesting thing right because on the one hand you say there's a ticket it's a user story as an example um, that contains some kind of meaningful piece of work in an increment um, and moving that through my development flow could be very interesting um, to measure that and i think that makes sense on a certain level right because we speak about velocity we speak about flow of work um, i would rather say counting tickets done is still something that can be helpful in a specific way, as long as that is not my only measurement. Um, because then we have that clever tech people again saying, oh, it's amount of tickets, right? So let's break down that very simple sub story in 15 tasks, um, each of them being a ticket, and then I slowly move forward. Um, and the only thing I actually create is obviously overhead um, and, and nothing else. So that can be an indicator, um, and we see it's rather complex and easy in all of that direction. Um, so counting stuff, counting, being output oriented, and this is also what the title of the talk is, um, is maybe not the best direction but helpful for indications. Then let's maybe go a bit more technical. Um, and uh, uh, I brought something with me uh, that you probably know, it's the Dora metrics, um, put it a bit with a question mark as I didn't know about the audience. Um, uh, so I'll go into, into a bit of detail in, in a second. Um, I personally must say I'm not a, so I like the Dora metrics, um, but I also see them as some kind of indirect measurement, right? Because um, uh, they, and we will see that in a second, they actually doesn't tell you whether your organization performs very well. Um, it gives you indications where you, so you can compare with each other. And that's like the, probably the minimal standard that there is in the industry. If you want to say, oh, how performance is my, uh, my, my organization? I would like to compare it um, with others. Um, then, then Dora metrics and the corresponding uh, measurements are the right ones, um, but it's still very high level. So let's look into that um, a bit more detail. Um, so the first one um, is obviously the deployment frequency, right? And the question behind that is, how often can I ship stuff to my customers? Um, and uh, I think an interesting thought behind is that I can also say, okay, how often can I create, create value for my customers, right? So how often can I can I bring something new? Um, the second one that, that we just put here is kind of the lead time for changes. Um, so what does it mean um, in, in terms of draw metrics? Actually, you do commit, and we now know what a commit is, right? Um, how how much time does it take to get that into production? Um, and again, create value for the customer. Thirdly, um, also very important here is the change failure rate. Um, so the interesting question, how good is the stuff that you ship, right? So doing five deployments doesn't mean nothing if each of these deployments actually cause a production error, because then there is something wrong um, in the process and obviously then also within the organization. Um, and that gives a very good indication. And last but not least, it's a point about how fast am I to restore stuff. It's a bit of a, um, let's say, an aggregation um, of, of the previous runs, right? Because I can only restore fast if, I have, if I'm able to have like a high deployment frequency. Um, if I'm able to push work quickly through my my deployment, uh, sorry, my, my development lifecycle, um, and obviously um, uh, uh, I'm needing less time um, if, if I don't have that much um, issues in production.
So indicator, by the way, is all of that's going for production, right? Um, because I sometimes see developers saying, oh, um, I handed the ticket over to QA. Now I'm done. Let's go for the next one. Um, and uh, at least from my perspective, if you have developers like that in your team, um, just give them a slap, right? Because um, at the end, uh, the core message is things are in, are done when they are done, and that means the production and even beyond, um, just to keep that in mind. I spoke about part of being able to compare um, companies with each other, and uh, the Dora metrics actually come from a, from a research team um, uh, that was, so the history is a bit longer, right, but at the end, um, Google acquired a company or team um, that very deeply um, investigated and did a lot of scientific research um, into that metrics, and they compared companies with each other um, according to these metrics, and they figured out that companies being more on the elite side or on the higher side of things, they are actually from a business perspective way more successful than companies being maybe in the, the low performing area. Um, and I think that is a part that you can take in as, or, as an orientation here. And from the business side, um, being in the situation to ask uh, questions around, okay, hey, folks, please tell me how many deployments actually um, contain some kind of issues, um, how fast can we deploy and ship stuff uh, is super important. And not just from the business side, but also maybe from the tech side, because maybe sharing some kind of anecdotal um, here. Um, so I supported once a company um, where they developed like a more a monolith a monolithic side of things, right? So not microservices. Um, and one deployment took one hour. Um, and what happened? Uh, the developer actually wanted to do deployment. I said, oh, it's 12, um, so let's start the deployment. Let's go for lunch and coming back and see whether either it failed or was successful, um, uh, which is obviously nothing that you would like to have. Um, on the other side, um, taking or zooming out there, that also means you're typically able to deploy eight, maximum nine times per day, right? Because Normally, developers um, work within the time frame. Uh, if you have multiple teams working on the same code base, then you're screwed, right? Because then you can't just do that often. Um, so taking care of that makes a lot of sense. And that brings me to my next point here, and that's more KPIs to look at along that kind of software development life cycle. Um, I brought a random example with me, and you probably have seen it shorter or also longer. I also saw it longer. Um, typically, like you know, you have kind of a backlog of ideas, things that need to be done. Um, at a certain point, they are part of a, they become part of a sprint or they are picked for being worked on. Um, uh, then they go into progress. Um, uh, there's a code review potentially. There is QA. There is some kind of um, staging system. Then it's maybe ready for production at a certain point, right? When you know um, now it's ready to go live, we're done um, when, when things are in production. So we saw already um, that the uh, lead time by the Dora metrics is looking at the commit level, right? So whenever you do change, how fast do you get it to production? Um, if I look at companies in the development process, what I typically see or look at um, uh, is, is one thing that is just called lead time, right? So the, the, the question of, okay, I picked the task to be worked on. How much time does it take me? or the team to actually go from it's ready for development if you want so until it's done in production. Um, why is it interesting? Because if you look at the kind of software development process, uh, what you typically would like to do is to optimize for flow, right? So you work rather without any issues and uh, glitches flow through that um, uh, process. And uh, if that works pretty well, um, then, then you're doing a good job and you can ship stuff relatively fast to your customers. Um, and lead time give you some kind of indication how good are you doing there. Um, the second part, it's the uh, cycle time. Um, and that's actually the point of, okay, someone started to work at a piece of, um, or at a task um, until it's in production. The interesting part here is um, that the cycle time can be way shorter than the overall lead time, right? Because if things are just waiting to, to be started and to be worked on, um, that can be a huge difference. And it's maybe some kind of indicator um, that something in your process is not correct as it should be, or it's exactly like you wanted, but without knowing that in piece of information, you will not get anywhere. Um, that brings you to, to one of the, I personally find most interesting KPIs if you look into the, the development cycle, and that is time in stage. Um, I'm not just, so I'm pointing out here, it's from staging to ready for production, but the more interesting part is um, how it, uh, to measure that for each of the stages, right? Because um, what that shows you or enables you to see is, um, oh shit, all of my work is actually stuck in QA because it's just waiting for, there for weeks 
hopefully not for weeks, but for days um, or maybe just hours, um, which is a good indicator that um, maybe your QA team is too small, that processes are too complex, um, that um, uh, the requirements are not clear, whatever else. Um, the same goes for all of the other pieces. If you combine that with estimations, and I know software engineers are a bit afraid of estimations, I heard that, um, I can't understand why, um, uh, then it gives you a very good indication, especially for that in-progress part, um, to be able to say, okay, over a certain amount of time, we can figure out that for kind of a L, M, S, X, L, whatever t-shirt size you measure or story points, um, what is the typical time that we really need for that specific task, right? Um, and it's not, please, dear software engineers, that's not meant to measure your performance, right? It's something that allows people to plan better um, because they get like a bit of an idea to know um, how how much time does a team actually need for um, specific um, broad pieces. So this is all going into one direction. Um, uh, unfortunately, at least in software development, um, work is not only going in one direction, but um, it's also going backwards sometimes, right? Um, so assuming the 10x developer developed something really nice, um, but at the end QA say, sorry, it's not meeting requirements, there's a bug, you need to fix it, then it's going back in progress. What is very interesting to measure from my perspective is to understand, okay, how often, uh, and I would also add that part here, how often are things coming back from QA, right? Uh, because that gives you indications of whether you have a fundamental problem in requirements, um, maybe the QA, maybe there's miscommunication, whatever else. Um, and that over return rate um, could theoretically be measured from each step, but typically things don't go back from staging. I mean, that happens as well, right? But it's more the outlier. Um, but knowing about these rates um, and um, uh, being able to, to investigate into that, that can give you a very good indication where you have blockers in your, um, in your, in your process. So, and the interesting part here is from my perspective, um, it's very good to have these numbers. Uh, you can always start now. So if you use Jira, you can just retrospectively get all these numbers. Um, I think that's also possible with another team. Um, the interesting part here is once you know, you will be able to set meaningful KPIs, right? And it could be, for example, that I say, oh, I'm optimizing um, for <clears throat> a QA fail rate um, of maximum of maximum 5% of all tickets, right? What does it mean if you're at 20% at the moment? That means you need to probably work on your requirements. You maybe need to work on the collaboration between QA and the development team and the product management, um, all of that stuff. You maybe need to optimize your process and so on and so forth. Um, the same goes for, for all of the other parts, especially time and stage, mentioning the deployment example, right? Eight, uh, sorry, one hour for deployment is just too much. Going further here, the core question is, what are your developers busy with, right? So what are you doing the, all, the, the whole day? The funny part here is um, there are many, many options or opportunities to actually spend time by the developing, right? Um, I just put a couple of them with me. Um, the classical thing I mentioned already, deployment, right? They're just taking time. What is the developer doing? Okay, taking coffee, having a chat, um, hopefully not starting to work on something else. Um, we have the whole topic around CI, automated tests, maybe there's infrastructure deployments, maybe I need to spin up my local stack or fix it. Um, so typically that is all stuff that tech people do while they are supposed to do kind of feature development or bug fixing um, in parallel, right? And that's obviously consuming time that sometimes created the perception of, oh dear, um, the developer worked all day, right? And then he just did half of the very simple user story that um, he was actually um, tasked with to do. On the other side, I think that is controllable, right? Because you can just optimize that. On the other side, you have all the stuff at meetings is my favorite here, right? Um, because um, meetings is something that everyone hates to do or most people hate to do, um, developers especially, tech people. Um, but uh, it's still something they spend a lot of time in. Um, I think the point here is um, being sure in measuring and analyzing how much time per, per team members actually spend in meetings. Um, uh, your stuff, okay, I have, I, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what to build or how to build it, right? You're missing some kind of design element. Uh, you're missing um, uh, the understanding of how a filter should specifically work. All of that is actually kind of consuming time because you need to go back to people. You have a dependency on people. We all know dependencies in software or in tech are not a good idea um, mostly. So you need to figure out all of that stuff and that typically consumes time. 
Um, I brought a couple of other things with me. Um, one thing um, that that um, I, I didn't put here, but it's like a core question because what is your tech team really working on? Um, that is a funny thing because very often, at least at least according to my experience, but I mean, obviously we already saw I'm, I'm living in a different world. There's some kind of hidden work, right? Um, so the typical, hey, Stephen, can you look into the database and provide me that information? And Stephen says, yeah, sure, I can do that because I'm just waiting for the deployment to finish, right? So stuff like that is typically something that you should try to prevent to work. And at first, the first step here is to somehow figure out what's going on there, right? And they very often see organizations um, that say, oh yeah, I have a good understanding. And then if you talk to the people directly, you find reality. And the reality is often very different um, compared to what they say. So being very strict, um, being um, forcing people to create other tickets or something that is like a work item um, is highly recommended because otherwise um, people are spending time on stuff that you haven't a clue of. Um, and that doesn't actually um, bring any value. <clears throat> Secondly, um, I would definitely recommend to look into the distribution. So, so putting a KPI to hidden work, that's tough, right? Um, because it's hidden uh, and it, the only chance is to uh, kind of educate your people to avoid that and push it away. That is a more interesting thing. Um, so understanding and uh, for the people doing Scrum, right? Um, okay, we plan to spring, there's stuff in there. How much of that work is actually planned and the real work that is done, how much of that was actually unplanned, right? Because the core question is, um, am I able to deliver on what I was pro what I promised and committed to? Um, and uh, if you figure out, for example, that the majority of your time is not feature work, but you're doing bug fixing or kind of firefighting, then obviously you're in the wrong direction, um, at least according to any KPIs. And uh, firstly, knowing about these numbers and I mean, you see, I'm always coming back to the point of you should know your data. Um, and knowing about that numbers allows you and enables you to actually steer the direction. Because if you say, oh, I want my development or tech teams to work 70% of the time on features, and only, let's say, the rest on other stuff, um, uh, and I'm currently at the opposite uh, direction, it's just 30% and the rest of the firefighting, then it shows you that you obviously have problems in the development process, um, that there are problems obviously in the quality control um, that you're doing, uh, and these are kind of good indications to go then in the right direction and start to fix that stuff. Um, that is, by the way, a very good answer um, to also show to business people, right? Because if you say that is, that is our current status, that's fine, right? We know it's not optimal, this way I would like to be um, and making it transparent there, repeating that every time that can just be helpful. If I sum that up and put that into kind of the first takeaway is, so at the end, it's about a process, right? And uh, I mean, when I talk to non-tech people, right, they really optimize their business processes. They try to be as efficient as possible. And from my perspective, there is no reason why you shouldn't apply the same principles, the same ideas also to your tech processes. And at the end, it's about business thing as well, right? It's also business process. The only thing here is that it's building other things. Um, so if you have done that, and imagine you're coming up with the perfectly oiled machine, right? It's flowing through, it's perfectly aligned. Um, there's still one problem because, and that comes to the outcome part now, uh, it's great if you have an awesome machinery, if nobody wants to kind of use the products um, that, that are being produced, uh, then you're in a shitty situation anyway. Um, and I think here it comes about the output versus outcome and everything that we saw so far was mainly related to output, kind of amount of work that you're able to do in a specific time frame. Um, uh, like, like I just mentioned here, um, but uh, what is more interesting for the business at the end is not the output, but it's the outcome, right? And this is at the end um, kind of the way how things turn out like a consequence of what you're doing, right? So you're producing a feature or you're providing a feature, um, it hopefully improves or changes customer behavior uh, and then eventually has some kind of impact um, as customers or users users are more willing to pay for a product and use it more um, to get more data um, sell more stuff at the end. So I think the core question um, that everyone asks um, is, okay, how can you make sure that you create outcome at the end and not just output? Um, so I'm, if I'm very honest, uh, that's a topic. So I think you could just talk one hour about only that topic. Um, uh, because at the end, it's a lot about doing experiments, um, having hypotheses, um, validating these, going fast iterations, and all of the stuff that we saw before, 
that helps you to be able to be fast, right? So doing the iterations in a very short time frame. Um, the core, core question still is um, how do you make sure that you're building the right things? So um, you can read books about it. Um, one very good starting point that at least I saw um, being very helpful in a question to ask is um, speak about something um, that we actually call business case. Um, probably everyone knows that, right? So the core question is, if I'm going to implement something, um, how much revenue uplift or whatever your, your measure of success is, um, will they generate? So super easy um, because that is something you can hopefully easily do. Um, it's even more easy than people think, right? Especially developers, they often think about, oh, how can I create a business case for refactoring? Um, that's not too tough, uh, by the way, um, but something doable. And then the second part is put some kind of costs of that. Right. And then you have a comparison because at the end, um, at least in my perception, tech teams are often seen as something that's the black box. It's expensive. Right. But if I actually interact and work with them and give them kind of work to do, um, then it's a bit of free lunch. Right. Because there is no cost factor behind this. Yes, my fixed costs. But I mean, I have no clue what the feature development actually costs um, at the end. If I take it very seriously, and that's by the way also what business people do, right? Um, so they break it down to each single process step and can exactly say if the accountant is spending like five minutes um, on doing the bookings um, in, the, um, in the in the finance uh, part, then they can tell you, okay, that costs like five euro as an example. So I'm I'm a huge fan of saying, okay, let's also break it down to engineering um, or tech teams, right? Not in an extent of five minutes or whatever else, right? But hey, you have fixed salaries. Um, <clears throat> uh, please don't forget all of the overhead, right? So people need to work somewhere like in a nice office like that. Um, they they need to have some kind of hardware um, to work with, licenses, all that stuff. So it's way more expensive than just the salary. But whatever your starting point is, um, break that down to single developer hour or day if you want, like any other company does does as well and every, every other area. Um, and then just do a bit of math. Here the estimations comes into the game, right? Because if you have no clue how much time things take, then it's hard to put like value behind that. Um, but uh, having at least a rough idea also provides a number and say, okay, even if it's like looking to make less bull, uh, it's a minimum of um, five days and a day costs, let's say, 1,000 euro. That feature will cost uh, me uh, to implement like 5,000 euro. Um, so then you can decide what that's worth, right? And I brought very simple business cases with me that are no brains, obviously, right? This value, hey, we're creating kind of a lot of money in a certain time frame, cost 20K, so that's definitely something you should do, obviously, right? Um, maybe there's stuff that you should do before because it's generating more business value compared to the costs, right? Um, that's another story that's about prioritization. Um, the second example, if it's other way around, like 30K compared to 80K, um, that doesn't make sense. Now, I think this is like stupid, right? Because obviously no one is asking for that. Um, sharing experience here as well, um, and, and I can just highly recommend to ask that question, how much value does the request create that you're asking for? And I said together with a finance team, right? They wanted to implement or have us implement like five different features. We said, okay, that's nice. We can do all of them. We can do estimations, um, but please share with us what is kind of the upside you're generating with these five, five features. And then we talked a bit and it turned out that two of them were actually completely useless. Right. They were just someone had an idea. Yeah, that could make sense. Um, uh, and, and one was super, super um, uh, impactful. Right. So that saved like one FTE overall um, uh, over a year. And the other two were kind of cash. Right. So um, uh, but not asking or having not asked that question would have led us to situation we build something and then figure maybe if we look into that, obviously. Right. But then figuring out. OK, it was worthless um, and it was time that we could have spent on way more impactful things um, in, a, in a better. So having that question being asked and putting your costs, it's simple math and everyone can do that. Um, and I would highly, highly recommend to do that. So maybe the last point that I brought with me here, the business value is unknown, uh, but you you probably have like very little costs. That's a very good question and a tough one, if I'm honest, right, because that seems to be like a good candidate for an experiment, right? Um, I think the question is, um, I would highly recommend to time box things like that. Um, maybe you have some kind of experiment, uh, experimental budget that you can use for that. Um, but if you really, really go hardcore, then you would rather say, that, no, that's no, right? Because 
the probability that you have stuck in your pipeline that creates more business value overall is relatively high, right? And then it's a bit of the question mark of what is the assumption here? So I've forced everyone to just think about these numbers. So being already a takeaway number two, and there are only two, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, so highly recommend um, to, to create kind of business cases compared with the real costs or the assumed costs that are behind, um, because that is a very good indicator that your teams are going to do the right things. Um, it's not a guarantee, but it's a, it's a good indicator because it forces people who are asking for stuff to think twice whether it's worth to spend 50,000 developer costs um, on a specific thing or not. Um, and uh, feeling more accountable because, hey, that's a shitload of money um, for the for the normal person. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to think about whether you should spend it or not, or there are more things in the pipeline that create more value potentially. I'm perfectly in time, at least according to that clock here. So thank you for listening. Um, also for the people in the, in the Teams call, if there are any questions, um, then feel free to shoot. I'm um, also here for, for a moment. Um, yeah, but thanks a lot for listening. <clears throat>